Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Rob. And this is Ask Rob and Rob. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask Rob and Rob. It may be getting a bit dark outside. You know what? We'll try and lighten things up here with another episode of Ask Rob and Rob, the show where you give us your wonderful questions and we try to give you some illuminating answers. But for that to happen and for this roadshow to carry on, you need to get your questions in. So how do you do it? Well, it all starts with a voicemail, and there's two ways of doing it. You can either give us a call on 013 808 0035, or you can go to propertyhub.net slash ask. Just record your question there, re-record if you get it wrong, it's totally fine. Then it'll magically wing its way over to us, and in the fullness of time, we will provide an answer. Just like we're about to for Arjun. Hi Rob and Rob, Arjun here. Thanks for all that you do for us. It's really, really helpful. It's made a massive impact, especially on my learning about property. I want to ask both of you a question about where investors make the biggest gains in property. Both of you always mention that the biggest gains are made in capital returns, but uh, I would have thought it's actually an income simply because you get that into your bank account each month or each quarter. I would like to really sort of hear about your thoughts on this. Uh, Thanks very much for all the help. Keep it up. Cheers. Thank you for this question, Arjun. Really enjoy this topic, so I'm glad you asked. You're right, we do often mention how the biggest gains are in capital returns, and that is true. If you look at historical returns from property, the returns from capital growth over time exceed what you would get in terms of income. This has also been true at our own portfolios. The capital growth dwarfs the return you make from income. However, you make an important point. The income is money that you receive into your bank account each month. You know with a decent amount of certainty what that income is going to be. Yes, you might have a void or you might have unexpected expenses, but over time, when you buy a property, you can look at all the numbers and assuming you've got everything right, you'll know roughly what's going to be coming in. On the growth side, you do need to have a bit of faith. You're making assumptions about what's going to happen in the future. And however well you do your research, there are a lot of key variables that are completely outside your control. So you can never be sure what's going to happen. So just because it's been the case historically doesn't mean it always will. So both elements are important. The income is important because it's the bit that you're more sure about. And frankly, you need it to pay all the outgoings on the property and anything extra you can roll into your next deposit. But the growth is important as well, because that's where the majority of the returns historically have come from. You can also deliberately tilt your portfolio in the direction of one or the other. So we're talking about averages here, but there are certain properties in certain parts of the country that haven't had any meaningful growth in a very, very long time, but they do pay out a particularly high yield. These tend to be cheaper properties, so the rent as a proportion is relatively high. You can also tilt your portfolio in the opposite direction and target properties that might not yield so well, but you think have the best potential for capital growth. You're never going to get the perfect property to deliver both. It just doesn't happen. It's not the way it works. But you can decide which element is relatively more important for you and make purchases with that in mind. If it's the case that you just don't care about growth at all and cash in the bank is all you care about, then you can buy properties with that aim in mind. But in general, if you go somewhere in the middle, it's the rental income that you'll notice month to month and even year to year. But give it 10 years. Look back and work out what your capital growth has been over that time and what your rental profit has been over that time. And I think you might be surprised by which one comes out on top. Brilliant answer, Rob. Next up, we've got Daniel, and his question really complements the first one. So let's have a listen to that. Hi, Robin Rob, APOL. My name's Daniel, and I've been listening to your podcasts for about a year now and kind of looking into getting my first property. But I keep hearing about these percentile yields you should look out for, and some people on the internet are saying like 10% can be like the maximum in Liverpool or 8 or 7% is what you should ideally be looking for. But when I'm doing my calculations in terms of my funding about £30,000, the best I can find is like 6% or a little bit lower. And it might be because of the push of sales I've heard recently. I mean, there's a lot of house sales, as you've pointed out in some of your podcasts. What do you take from that? I know you've before mentioned that as long as you can pay your bills, then it's fine. But if I buy something with a 6% yield, is that a mistake? Or even, God say, 4%? What should I really be looking for realistically that's uh, within my budget? I um, appreciate that. Have a great day. Daniel, in Liverpool, it's going to depend on what type of area you're going after. If you're going after one of the best areas, which is something I'd advise you to do if you're looking for any sort of capital growth, then your yields might not be as high as some forums suggest. However, there are parts of Liverpool where absolutely you can achieve 8% return and maybe beyond. 
but those areas are not going to get the capital growth that you want and a tenant profile those properties will attract potentially could mean a little bit more work for you running that property as well so it's a trade-off what are you prepared to sacrifice to maximize your yield will an extra percent make a difference over the long term well as we've already heard no not really so if you offered me a property in liverpool with an eight percent yield or a six percent yield but the one with six percent was in a far superior area then I'm taking a 6% one all day long because I know even in the medium term, that capital growth is going to more than make up for it. And the other thing to remember is that people will put out certain different returns that they expect. I mean, I remember when we first started recording a podcast, we talked about 10% returns. We don't even get close to that anymore. So you've got to also be careful of people living off past victories and that actually the return that they once got is no longer valid in today's market. But the main thing is, Daniel, if you find an investment that you really like and the yield is decent, then I'd consider just pushing ahead. The difference of an extra percent or two to your current lifestyle is going to be minimal. But the difference of a well-chosen property for capital growth purposes to your lifestyle in the future can be dramatic between one property and another. So best of luck with your decision. And I hope your investment goes really well. This is why I love Ask Rob and Rob. Sometimes we get to help people out with really detailed tactical questions that get them out of a sticky situation. And sometimes, like today, we get to talk about big picture strategy. But all of it can be super valuable. So thank you to everyone who keeps their questions coming in. And as the questions are still coming in, we'll be back to do it all again next Tuesday. But before then, we'll see you for the Property Podcast on Thursday. Until then, bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye.